Hi, this is Phil at Simply Rhino, and this is the first in a series of beginner level videos for architectural users. In this video, I'm going to look at using Rhino like SketchUp. More specifically, I'm going to use Rhino tools to emulate the push pull modeling technique in SketchUp. This is a process that is ideal for the quick modeling of solids that are predominantly planar. And this building has been built almost exclusively with this editing methodology. But first, I'd like to put this video into some sort of context. Rhino is extremely popular in the world of architecture, and many of the world's largest and most well-known architectural and engineering practices use Rhino and Grasshopper in their daily workflow. In this use case, Rhino is often associated with the creation and development of challenging and complex curved geometry. Despite this association with large studios and complex geometry, Rhino is an ideal software for smaller and owner-operated practices. Those who are, for example, using AutoCAD LT for 2D work and SketchUp for 3D modeling. Indeed, Rhino is a compelling alternative to this combination, offering an integrated environment with a full suite of 2D drafting tools and real, manufacturable surface and solid geometry that can be exchanged with Revit and all the major industry standard tools. As I mentioned earlier, this building has been built in Rhino using the push-pull technique almost exclusively. The starting point for this was some 2D hand sketches and then some 2D line work that was built into a massing study. That massing study was then refined to the state that we see here. But today, let's look at creating the massing study. Before we do this, let's look at a couple of basic conventions in Rhino. If I left click on an object, I'll select the object in its entirety. And if I hold down Shift and Control and left click, then I'll enable what's called sub-object selection, where I can pick a face or a number of faces, or I can pick an edge or a number of edges. Next, if I turn on the Gumball Manipulator, we'll have a tool that allows me to move objects in a predetermined, constrained direction. And, as well as moving, I can rotate and scale. I can get to the settings of the Gumball by right-clicking here, and we'll need to change these settings to make the best use of push-pull editing in Rhino. Let's have a look at the SketchUp tools that I want to emulate in Rhino. In SketchUp, if I create a closed shape, either with the Line tool or with the Rectangle tool, then those closed shapes immediately get a fill, and because of this I can use the Push-Pull tool to extrude them. And if I have two shapes, I can snap the height of these so that they are coincident. With the push-pull tool, as I move over a face, the face becomes highlighted and I can move that face inwards and outwards. The push-pull tool only works with faces, so if I want to move an edge, I'll need to use another method such as selecting the edge and then using the move tool. If we now go to Rhino and use the polyline tool, or as in this case the rectangle tool, all I'll create is curves or line work, as there is no fill or face inside of here. So there's an additional step that I need to do to make these into a solid on which I can move the edges and faces. If I go to the Solid Tools tab, I can use Extrude Closed Planar Curve and then left click on the curve, pull upwards and then left click to finish the command. If I'm only creating something simple like a box, then there's no need to draw a rectangle, because in Rhino we have solid primitives. And like SketchUp, I can snap to an existing object to constrain the height. If we're going to push-pull edit faces, then there are three distinctly different methods of doing this in Rhino. But perhaps the easiest way is to use the gumball. And first, I'm going to make some changes to how the gumball is set up. I'm going to make sure that the gumball is set to Align to Object and then enable Snappy Dragging. And finally, 
rotate view around gumball. If I now turn the gumball on and use sub object selection to pick a face, the gumball aligns itself to the face and I can now push pull edit that face by dragging on the blue arrowhead which is perpendicular to the face. Unlike SketchUp, sub object selection works on edges. So by moving the appropriate arrow, I can adjust edges as well as faces. And if you have snappy dragging enabled, then this allows you to snap to an existing object to constrain, for example, the height. Having introduced those Rhino basics, let's now have a look at the massing study. The first thing I'd recommend here is that rather than working solely in a perspective view, in Rhino it's very often a good idea to make use of the ortho views as well. And you can toggle between a maximized view and a full view by double clicking on the viewport title. I would also suggest making use of Rhino's layers, and here this model is layered by floor levels. So I'm going to turn off the visibility of the landscape, ground floor, second floor and sun terrace. This leaves the first floor and here we can see that conceptually each level of the building consists of a floor plate or slab on which we have glass boxes at the front and then if we come round the rear of the building we've got two solid boxes and then a central column for the stairwell. Now of course the slab is going to be pierced by the stairwell opening and the edges of the slab will sit inside the external facade at the rear. But for now, keeping this as a simplified stack of volumes makes it easier to change sizes and proportions. By working either in full view or in a combination of maximized ortho views, I can use an AutoCAD-like approach of creating two-dimensional line drawings. But as these exist in a 3D environment, I can, for example, move these plan views to their correct floor height. So here, if I isolate the first floor and change the display mode and look at this in full view, you'll see that I've got some very simple boundaries drawn out here to describe the basic volumes in plan and elevation. And I can use these as a template or guide to build our three-dimensional volumes from. You'll see that I've used object color to differentiate these various elements. I can use the solid primitive tools to build in these volumes very quickly. So this is the glass box I'm creating here and let's now create the solid box behind them. And you'll see that the 2D reference for the solid box is outlined in white and the central column is outlined in red. If we look at the slab, the 2D reference is drawn differently to how I might want this in the end. So for now, I'll extrude this to its basic rectangular shape. Here's what I actually want the slab to look like. So in this end area around here, it steps in by one meter, and then around the central area, it steps out by one meter and extends outwards by five meters. Going back to the simple rectangular slab, I'm going to draw some lines on the rear face of the slab and Rhino's end, near and perpendicular object snaps will help accuracy here. I'll create two lines snapping these to the corners and I'll move the second line along by a distance of one meter. I can turn on the gumball to do this. If I click on the red arrow and type in 1000, as my model is in millimeters, and hit enter, then I can move a precise distance in a constrained direction. If we look at the slab in the top view, you'll see that my geometry is set about the world Y axis. So, if I want to copy these two lines onto the other side of the slab, which is symmetrical, I can pick them, go to the transform menu, and choose mirror and then choose the y-axis prompt with the copy option on. Now, when we want to edit between these areas that I've delineated with a line, then this is where the Rhino process differs again from SketchUp. In SketchUp, assuming my slab isn't grouped or made into a component, when I draw these lines on the side of a slab, I can immediately go to the push-pull tool and start editing. 
In Rhino, we have an additional step because this slab is a solid object and not a collection of faces. That additional step is to split this rear face with these four lines. If I go to the Solid Tools tab and pick Split Planar Face, I select the face to split and then Enter to confirm. And next I choose the Curve option in the command line and pick these four lines. And then Enter to confirm. And you'll see that the rear of the slab is now split into five faces. Two things to note here is that in Rhino lines are generically called curves and that the solid editing tools that work on faces and edges don't require sub-object selection. The rear of the slab is now ready for push-pull editing so I can shift Control left click on this face and if I click on the arrow and type in 5000 then rather than creating an extrusion this function merely moves this face which of course moves the adjacent faces creating this angular condition. Instead if I click on the little blue ball here and type in my value this is the extrude tool and this will create the new perpendicular faces that I need. So with the gumball we can both move and extrude faces and it's important to understand the difference between the two. To create the cutout at the ends of the slab I can select both of these faces at once, pick on the blue ball and type in minus 1000 to extrude in the opposing direction to the blue arrow. When we extrude outwards we create a split in the face here at the top and the bottom of the slab. This split may be useful further down the line but it could also be problematic. So if I want to clean up any split faces like this, I can right click on this tool to run Merge All Coplanar Faces. And that will clean up the whole of the top of this slab. And of course, now if I want to change the height of this slab, because it's all one face, I can do that very easily. So, I can create all of these volumes on the massing study using the simple editing techniques that I've outlined so far. Let's now look at creating the simplified landscape. I'm going to turn off the solid massing layers that I've created so far, leaving the original line work. And then I'll switch to four view. Next, I'm going to turn off all the layers except the landscape layer. Now you can see that I have an open polyline for the landscape here and a closed polyline for the simplified version of the external stairs. Let's now look at extruding this simplified landscape. I'm going to turn on the gumball and change the alignment settings to align to seaplane as this will make things a little easier when working with curves. I'm also going to make sure that the landscape massing layer is my active layer. Then I'll pick the open polyline and pull on the red ball here to extrude. When I get to the length that I want, and this is an arbitrary length at the moment, I can extrude the same distance the other side of the curve by holding down shift to enable the both sides option. The resulting extrusion will, of course, be open, and this is effectively a polysurface, which is Rhino terminology for a series of surfaces joined by their coincident edges. Next, I'll hide the landscape extrusion so we can look at the simplified stair block. I'm going to use an extrusion command rather than the gumball to do this, and I know that the width of the stairs is going to be 4,400 millimeters. Here, I have a closed polyline that sits on the center line of that distance, and if I go to the Solid Tools tab, and use Extrude Closed Planar Curve, then you'll see by default the extrusion only happens on one side of my closed polyline, depending on which side I pull the cursor. In the command line I can select the Both Sides option and then I can type in the distance of the extrusion. When I'm extruding both sides with this method I need to type in half the total distance because it's a distance from the midpoint 
to one of the edges. So here I would type in 2200 followed by enter to create the solid object. One thing to note is that when an option like both sides is selected, then this option will remain on next time I use the extrusion command. If I now show the landscape extrusion, you'll see that at the moment the landscape is effectively going straight through the simplified stair block. So we don't have a defined edge here. If I want to remove the area of landscape that is being intersected with the stair block, I can use this tool which is called Split. I first select the object to split, which is the landscape, and enter to confirm, and then I pick the cutting object, which is the stair block, followed by enter. To see the result, I'll hide the stair block, and then I can manually delete the split area. If I now unhide the stair block, we get a nice crisp line around here. And this will help if we're doing any screenshots or display modes in Rhino where we want to see these edges. But of course, we'll also have much more accurate geometry. Let's now turn on the other massing elements and you'll see that we've got most of the massing study complete now. Around the rear of the building here, I'll use split again to remove the intersecting elements of the landscape. As before, this improves all the clarity of these edges and again gives us more accurate geometry. If we look at the second floor slab, then on the more developed versions of the model, there's a chamfer on the underside. So let's have a look at creating that. I'm going to isolate this second floor slab and I can do this in the visibility tab and using this tool here, which is called Isolate. The object that I've selected remains visible and all the other objects become hidden. The slab is 1100 mm deep and the intent here is that the bottom 800 mm is chamfered inwards by 800 mm. I'll turn on the gumball and make sure the alignment is set to Align to Object. I'll sub-object select the top face and reduce the height by 300 mm. Next, I'll extrude this top face upwards by the same distance and this will give me a new set of edges around the perimeter of the slab. I can now sub-object select an edge here and move this inward by 800 mm to create the first chamfer. And then simply repeat this on all the other chamfered edges. To show the hidden geometry, I can right click on the Isolate tool to unisolate. Finally, to clean up these coplanar faces at the rear of the slab, I can right click on this tool here to merge all coplanar faces. We now have a nice clean model that contains all the major volumes of the building and landscape. If I want to change proportions and sizes, then Rhino's push pull metaphor makes this easy. In the next video, I'll look at adding more detail to the model, creating window openings and adding wall thicknesses and internal partitions. So that's about the end of what I wanted to cover in this video. Thanks for watching and please feel free to leave any comments below. If you found this video useful, then please hit the like button and remember that to keep up with the latest developments in Rhino, you can subscribe to this channel. At Simply Rhino, we offer training for Rhino and all its key plugins. So check out our website for more details. Thanks again for watching and I'll catch up with you in the next video.